first item on today's agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have some scheduling announcements. Um, first, that next uh, week uh, we will be uh, potentially, that's on November 20th, um, voting on the HIE plan, which we're going to hear about today. We're also going to hear from our own team on uh, the all care model benchmark update. And then um, we had moved an item on the, the discussion on the ACO 2018 results from today to next week. So that will definitely be occurring next Wednesday. Um, also next Wednesday, November 20th, we have the primary care advisory group. And um, that is that will take place at a public meeting at our offices on 144th State Street, and that starts at 5 p.m. <coughs> and then, I don't want to put her on the spot, but on Thursday, November 21st, we, we as a board, the board members will be attending the Rural Healthcare Task Force, but as noted on the agenda, this is not a formal public meeting. And Robin, do you want to just give a few highlights of what's happening in sure. the Barry? Yes, so November 21st from 1 to 3 at uh, the, thank you, oh. uh, NVRH, uh, the Rural Health Services Task Force will be having a listening session, which will consist of a very brief overview on the, what the task force is and what the charge is and the work that we're doing. And then uh, we'll ask people to split up into small groups and talk about some discussion questions and then come back together as a big group to share the information. So. That's, I think, going to be a really interesting meeting, and we'll learn a lot. Thank you. Thank you for that update. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. No, no problem. problem. Appreciate it. Um, and then the next week is the week of Thanksgiving, so we are having a meeting that is scheduled on Monday, no November 25th, um, to, again, talk about the all care model benchmark proposal with a potential vote. Um, and then, again, that is Thanksgiving week. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Um, I have nothing else to report unless there are any questions about November schedule. Thank you, Susan. Next item of minutes of Wednesday, October 30th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. We moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, October 30th. Without any additions, deletions, or corrections, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, um, so we'll welcome our friends down front. <laughs> and Sarah, are you gonna tee this up or no? No. no? Okay. Just to take a step back uh, as a reminder to the group, 
the goals that were laid out in the HIV plan last year included creating one health record um, for every person in Vermont, improving the health care operations, and using data to enable policy and decision making. As we look at this year as an implementation year, you really will begin to see these goals weaved into the projects and, that we have been working on, specifically as we look at the collaborative service project as an example, we will begin to see these three uses, uh, or these three goals, driving the, the types of data that are coming into the health information exchange. <laughs> And you know, just like sort of a quick walk down memory lane. In, in 2017, um, the legislature asked us to do a comprehensive evaluation of HIV. And I think um, to sort of over, oversimplify the situation, things were opaque, and people didn't understand the problem, but they knew that they weren't getting the results that they wanted out of health information exchange. So uh, Health Tech Solutions, a third party, came in here and showed us or eliminated a number of different things for us, um, which can probably be summarized into Stakeholders need, need health information exchange, health data is needed for a lot of different reasons, and we weren't set up for success in achieving our health information exchange goals. So shortly after uh, that evaluation came out, um, we got moving very quickly on developing a stakeholder group called the Health Information Exchange Steering Committee, who formulated that first strategic plan which Shelley was referring to. And um, I think last year we were pretty clear on the fact that our goal really was to demystify the problem last year, to talk about the many nuanced component parts of health information exchange, why it's important and why it's hard, why we've, we've um, come up against so many challenges uh, in the landscape, not just us, but nationwide, you know, worldwide, um, in terms of getting the data that we need for the multitude of uh, reasons uh, that it's necessary. So um, I think that's an important sort of foundational thing to think about as we uh, walk you through uh, how we built upon that work <coughs> that started that in many ways kicked off in 2017. In terms of demystifying uh, health information exchange, there were a couple of key terms that were laid out in last year's plan. Um, one related to the health information. Um, the other also demystified in, the, in relationship as we go through to us talking about health information exchange as the verb, the actual exchange of health information, and as the noun, which is uh, the health the Vermont health information exchange, which is where we house the house and exchange the data through vital. In order for health info, in the, in the uh, evaluation that was conducted, in order for health information to be effect, health information exchange to be effective in Vermont, we identified that it needed a multifaceted environment in which uh, health information is moved. And it really had kind of several key pillars in addition to the technology which we typically think of as the health information exchange in Vermont. Those pillars import, included formalizing a governance structure uh, which we've done this year and, and uh, really worked on. Um, it included policy, and this year as we think about, po about our policy objectives and advancements, we really are talking about some of the consent policies that we have addressed. It included the financial goals and financial sustainability, and this year as we've, as we've looked at financial goals and financial sustainability, it's really been focused on ensuring that the resources that we have available um, are matched with uh, the amount of effort and work that are being put, put into it. Each of the pillars of the ecosystem must evolve um, in order to achieve our goals, and in order to make that happen, underneath each of these pillars is a tactical, you know, tactical um, objectives that are included in the tactical plan in, uh, that you have before you. And, you know, when we think back a couple of years, our view about health information exchange really my topic, like very focused on Vermont Vital, the leader of Vermont, excuse me, the Vermont Health Information Exchange, and not about the component parts that might be levers for their success. Um, so I think starting with this foundation is really important, and um, we're kind of illustrating here today through all of our sort of conversations about how the work is progressing, that without the policy, without the financial tools, 
without an appropriate governance structure. That technology is never going to meet our needs because it's not going to be built in a way that's reflective of what the needs actually are. Um, so we're just kind of always keeping this in mind. Of you know, we brought the steering committee together not to think about just what Vital does, but all of those component parts that are going to enable their success. <coughs> okay. And one of the foundational components <coughs> to their success is also looking off at the um, the technology components. And we're when we began to develop the health information technology plan last year, we really looked at the. Um, uh, national guidelines like those coming out from the Office of the National Coordinator and assess that against Vermont's key use cases. The steering committee identified components that must be in place in Vermont and you can see them, you can see those components here. Um, those are really uh, fall into three areas. Foundational services, uh, which are really the, the minimum expect, the minimum and foundational things that we need to be in place for the exchange of information. The exchange services, which really are kind of the core, some of the core technology um, that needs to be in place, and the end user um, services. As we go through today, we will, um, and specifically when we begin to talk about investments, we begin, uh, and through our technology roadmap this year, we really are looking at the foundational services uh, as being a core place for the public investments to be invested in, as are the exchange services. Um, the, End user services are typically services that those two uh, layers below need to um, support in terms of having the availability of the data, um, but typically maybe investments that are made outside of the health information technology investments, but are potentially made by additional organizations, uh, for example, um, the Accountable Care Organization. Sorry, just to underscore sort of why this is important. Okay to be sort of like a caveman about it, but it's really like you can't have step three without step one. And all we're saying here is that there are some basic things that have to be in place for us to get sort of the shiny fun tools that people talk about a lot. Like, how do we manage care using information and technology? How do we do analytics? How do we get real-time notifications of where our patients are? We can't do any of that kind of sort of shiny, important stuff without having identity management and security and consent protocol that works or interoper interoperable systems. So those, those um, foundational layers are why we think about public investment there, because it enables uh, data exchange and data use in the way that consumers and providers and patients are really thinking about. So what you saw in the 2018 and 2019 plan was really for the first time a way to potentially break um, break down in small digestible chunks how to actually achieve and get to our goals and objectives, and especially in terms of supporting the, in, the, the environment that we laid out, but also the technology infrastructure that was laid out. Specifically in 2018 and 2019, they established, um, they established some key objectives. Um, one of which was to ensure that we had a permanent governance model in place. Um, and I think we've, as we walk through today, we will connect this to our efforts and work, but really this begins to look like, or begins to be the HIV steering committee. The second, the second is incremental progress on some of those core foundational um, services and the core exchange services. And you begin to see that come alive as we talk about Act 53 and the consent policy changes, and you see that come, uh, come into uh, execution when we look at the collaborative services agreement that we will both talk about, but Vital will talk about in more detail. We're looking at implementing a long-term sustainability and finance, financial planning. As we move through today, we really are trying to achieve that right now in terms of honing in our operational efficiencies and creating value for investments in the future and developing the technical roadmap. While the HIE plan helped to, to establish some of the core things in the environment, we needed to take a look at what the technology needs were going forward and both what was happening at the national level, um, both from a policy standpoint and uh, in terms of technology advancements, and the roadmap will help us do that. So when we begin to think about, um, as we begin to think about our work this year uh, in terms of the progress that we've made that tie back to the areas, we really are looking at five specific areas or projects where we've made uh, advancements. Really we're looking at HIE governance, 
Uh, we're looking at looking at operational efficiencies and effectiveness by execution of the tactical plans and other elements, uh, such as the vital agreement, uh, health information technology roadmap and the creation of that this year, the collaborative services project, and moving from an opt-in to an opt-out consent policy. So, when we began, when we began to look at the, um, the evaluation in 2017, it really highlighted the lack of an accountable, uh, accountable party. Um, so in this past year, uh, in the plan last year, we really identified that there needed to be a permanent governance structure and that that governance structure needed to serve the needs of the HIE users. It needed to strengthen relationship between authority and accountability and they needed to engage a broad range of stakeholders. This comes directly out of the plan from last year. In order to put that into execution, the HIE steering committee this year um, put in place its permanent members. It finalized a charter, um, <coughs> finalized a charter in the last year uh, to establish clarity on its vision and approve the approaches of the, um, approve and look at approaches like HIE governance um, and also looked at how we could convene potentially subcommittees moving forward to move forward uh, things like our um, uh, development of the tactical plan and elements such as the, um, the connectivity criteria. What we believe will happen in 2020 related to governance is that we will focus on prioritizing su um, subcommittees and the current some of the current proposed areas may look at connectivity, data governance, and HIE consent coming out of some of the priorities from this year. I mean, I don't know if it's worth saying, but I will, that, you know, if we think back over the last couple of years, before we had the HIE steering committee, it was really not clear who was accountable for HIE success. And the Green Mountain Care Board and Viva sort of shared an oversight role over VITAL, which was not clear. And so that didn't help VITAL, you know, accomplish their goals. Um, it, it, it certainly did not help Duba sit in a strategic planning role or a uh, sort of liaison role across the healthcare system. So we're hoping, I mean, obviously we're working towards perfection, but you know, it's a process. Um, we're hoping that the committee is reflective of uh, the healthcare system in a way that we're building a strategic plan that helps vital accomplish goals that are real and meaningful and helps other uh, stakeholders invest in health information technology in a way that's not duplicative and is building on uh, sort of core services that exist in mostly So I think this slide helps to, this slide you will find in the health information technology, the health information exchange plan. And specifically the goal here is to, to outline clear authority and accountability across the system. So really looking at what the roles of the HIE steering committee is, what the ad hoc committees will do, the Green Mountain Care Board, um, the VHI and other uh, organizations who are using the VHI, and their performance-based contracts. This gives us some structure for that level of accountability. The other thing that the HIE steering committee is, uh, the steering committee does is it helps create a link bet between the users of the health information exchange and, um, and the accountability for the health information exchange. So the, you will see that the makeup, the board, of makeup of the board represents key stakeholders um, that are uh, particularly strong users or inputs for the health information uh, ex exchange. I'm going to pause there. Any questions so far on kind of the, the governance structure or the, govern the governance activities of this year? Nope. So one of the other areas of focus this year were, are, you know, coming out of the work, the evaluation plan and coming out of uh, the oversight from Act 187, we've seen significant progress of vital and health information exchange in Vermont. We, in, in uh, 2019, we really worked to carry that, that forward through a couple of key areas. Um, one of them was to create goals and accountability in the contract with vital. I think what, what we've, uh, the connectivity criteria, which we'll talk about in just a second, is, is an example of this, where we were able to establish the connectivity criteria, um, which had been absent, uh, the, the clarity on, on exactly what was necessary in the, in the levels one, two, and three had been absent in the past, 
And we were able to establish that connectivity criteria in 2019. And in 2020, you will see the contract begin to uh, point more to, uh, point us forward in terms of more uh, practices and organizations moving from a tier one to a tier two and some level of accountability for that built into the contract. I think last year, Mr. Pellon, you asked, you know, so when you come back next year, am I going to see the vital contract aligned with the HIE plan? So if you pick up the vital contract in its current form and it's soon to be, you know, the 2020 form, you will see the exact subject matter of the HIE plan reflected in the contracts and like what is going to happen in that annual period to progress that area. So I think that's pretty substantial growth in terms of how the program mm -hmm. operates. Another area where I feel like we've made significant advancements in the HIE operations is uh, continuing to apply for and receive federal funds um, for the HIE and matching that with our Health Information Technology Fund. Um, what you will see in, as we go through the Collaborative Services, Collaborative Services Project, we were approached by multiple different organizations to fund multiple different, um, the same thing multiple different times. And our goal really in this year is to say, okay, how much revenue do we come, have coming in from our HIE fund? How can we uh, leverage that and continue to leverage that for federal funds? And line that up so that we're not exceeding the, both the, rev, exceeding the revenue from the HIT fund or the IAPD. And so we see some operational efficiencies there. We also see, le we also see that we've matched up the investments um, that are being made from those HIT funds with what's, what is uh, outlined and detailed in the HIT Uh, I think the other element that we're proud of is that uh, we've made considerable progress on all of the tactical elements in, in the plan. Um, and related to interfaces, we've begun to think about how we, how we will uh, leverage prioritizing new, new interfaces and how we will move the current interfaces from, from Tier 1 connectivity to Tier 2 and potentially Tier 3 connectivity. So let's talk a little bit about the advancements in the connectivity um, criteria. Uh, there were no significant or major changes in the overall framework for the connectivity criteria, but the HIE steering committee and the stakeholders that are involved in the HIT steering committee convened several times this year to review the data elements that are included in, in tier one, which are essentially, can we get information from an organization on the people um, that, they are, that they are serving? So really the baseline information. Tier two, which is really the sharing of the essential clinical information. So what's the base, what is it that we need for, for the sharing of, the, of that clinical information for it to be useful for organizations like the um, ACO, uh, state organizations like the Blueprint for Health, and also to be able to report on our all-payer model measures. So they matched up those, the, the, what is necessary for those organizations about what was available in the current electronic health records and created the Tier 2 criteria. For those things that were not necessarily readily available and were kind of stretch goals, uh, for the first time they, they created an, uh, the, the Tier 3 criteria. This is the direction that we might be, that we would be going in the future and would include things like the plan um, for uh, mental health follow-up as an example. And you can see how that might match up with the, with the um, all care model goals. So if you can't tell them like the walk down memory lane person, this is what they give me on my third day back from maternity leave for my best what has happened. Um, so, you know, connectivity criteria is, was born out of the Green Mountain Care Board. It's existed since 2014 and it's, it was a great concept to say, you know, how are we going to assure that uh, the connections that are being made between electronic health records and our central repository, the health information exchange, are actually of quality, you know, getting us what we want. And so, in 2014, and uh, I'm not speaking for you, you all know this better than I do, you know, it started as this, this sort of concept. In the last couple of years, Steve and Vital worked together to put a real structure around it. So to say, okay, so this concept is great, but like, how do we actually plug in and hold Vital accountable and act, ask our electronic health record vendors to adhere to a certain standard? And so that's what we did last year. Steve and Vital came together to create this three-tiered structure. So the concept was great, but we didn't have enough um, time to have the stakeholders all around the table to say, here are the exact data elements that I would need to do uh, improve operations, to do point of care support, to do quality reporting. 
And so Vital Now has engaged um, a stakeholder committee to start having those conversations. And they were able to put together a much more comprehensive set of data elements for tier two. And so why that's important is because tier one is like, you know, your name, your birthday, we know who you are, your demographic data. But tier two are really, how are we going to start using the data elements? And then tier three is, you know, I'm a blueprint, blueprint for health administrator, or I run the ACO. You know, in, as I wear different hats, what are my different data element needs? And how can I um, be guaranteed that the connections that the state or private sector are paying for are yielding the, the results that I need? So it's a progression of things. We haven't gotten to tier three um, in totality yet, and I think tier two is um, still in the works, but at least the structure gives us something to sort of work towards, and I think as Carolyn and Andrea would say, it gives them the authority to say, hey, the state of Vermont is asking for this, so you electronic health record vendor, um, you need to act on behalf of your provider organization. It gives them a lever to kind of call back on. Is the flow seamless from when uh, you know, the modern moves from Medicaid to commercial or back again? For the connectivity criteria? Yep. Uh, yes, because it's the information that's flowing from their healthcare provider. So if they, if when they change the from one um, insurance product to another insurance product, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to change healthcare providers. And so, since this is information coming from their healthcare providers, too vital, um, it shouldn't it shouldn't impact their health. Okay. But your question perhaps goes into a topic area of um, what do we ask of insurance carriers in terms of um, obligating their um, their providers, the providers that they have agreements with, to exchange data through the health information exchange. And that's probably a very bigger topic than you want to delve into today, but it is something to consider and something that we can talk about at Medicaid. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in creation of the tier two data this year, they did look at the prevalence um, what of the data that was available to help make some of those decisions. As we look forward to 2020, to 2020, um, and through this process this year, we've identified that this current cr um, connectivity criteria does not necessarily meet the needs of all different types of practices. Um, and so these were the updates, to, uh, as you look at these, the types of data that were updated in terms of the data elements this year, you will note that many of them are, are pretty healthcare specific. Um, as we think about next year, um, and we begin to think about uh, other types of data coming in, for example, as the, as the designated agencies um, convert over to new electronic medical records, and as we uh, work through the connectivity criteria and may be able to take in additional types of data sets, for those types of, for, for additional types of providers, we may need to look at segregating and creating additional types of um, connectivity criteria for them. Um, so, as an example, as you look at uh, um, as you look at a designated agency, they're going to have information on developmental services um, that may not necessarily be something that you would find in a traditional health record, or they may have information on and uh, more detailed information on mental health. Um, we plan on using the work that's already been done by Vermont Care Partners as an example, where they are already aggregating data to potentially create. Um, to create that uh, segregated connectivity criteria. Another example were women's health practices. While they collect a lot of the same health information that, uh, that primary care practices do, there are additional types of tests and, and other results that they may have that are not found in a primary care record. Questions on the connectivity criteria? <coughs> So the technical roadmap was a goal that, that we laid out to achieve in our tactical plan last year. The technical roadmap's purpose was to continue to advance the HIV plan by taking a look at the three core goals that were established and to evaluate the technical and policy landscape and engage stakeholders to provide guidance on future objectives and technical investments. So this really was to take um, and dive into the technology that, that we would look at. The technology roadmap was published late in September. 
with only enough time for the steering committee to go through the high level objectives. They've been receiving feedback and provided feedback throughout the plan, but the actual full tech, tech, uh, technology roadmap in its entirety was not available, and so we've already had to um, evaluate and create this year's HIE plan. And so from that standpoint, they did look at the, at the six overall goals and objectives in the technical roadmap, but we will spend 2020 really integrating um, what is in that roadmap into the tactical plan. So you will not see, uh, while, the, while it is attached, you will not see a full integration of that roadmap into this year's HIV plan. Okay, so the technical roadmap, um, just so you know and have a concept board if you do dig, dig into it, uh, it engaged a contractor. That contractor um, participated with 44 individual um, uh, 44 individuals and 16 organizations in order to develop it, and it supports um, the key objectives uh, that are aligned that are laid out in the HIE plan. So this is the collaborative services you've heard about several different times throughout the year through the through Vital. Um, Diva and the HIE steering committee were being, as I mentioned before, were being asked multiple times to make um, investments, particularly three times uh, by providers um, uh, directly. Um, we were, they were also being asked to invest in it through the, the ACO was also um, <clears throat> contributing and getting data and state government and agencies were contributing and getting data. Our goals were to try to begin to invest in the infrastructure, the, those foundational infrastructures one time. And also to make sure that we were creating a modular infrastructure um, and that we were doing it in a phased and responsible way. So in that, in that respect, the Collaborative Services um, project emerged in order to create phase one, which really um, put in place uh, the master person index or the ability, master piece index, the ability to match different records from the same person coming from different organizations. The ability to collect additional types of data um, and through our terminology services, so to really be able to map um, data that wasn't necessarily in standardized format and pull out additional information and data for that, and the ability to route and integrate integrate data. Um, it feels like a good time to stop and just remind folks. So, you know, back to we there are foundational elements that are required for success, right? And so, lots of people who care about health information exchange or facilitating health information exchange or using health data, we're trying to invest in the same foundational components to get the same quality data at the, at the back end, right? And so, those are people that, those are groups and people that Diva works with. ACO, the Blueprint, Vital, the provider community, others, were asking for basically the same thing because the same thing was broken across the system. So instead of investing in it multiple times, Diva said, great, so we're gonna create a comprehensive strategy where we invest one time, but it benefits all of the stakeholders. And so these are foundational things that are going to make the data more usable, more exchangeable, more interoperable for all of the end uses. Does that make sense? So an opportunity there, as we've looked at investing once, as, as a, an example in terms of the financial sustainability of the HIE, is that we're not going to pay for things twice. So we're not going to pay for um, the data repository, which is the phase two, um, at the HIE and the Vermont Clinical Registry. So at the clinical registry will actually sunset on December 31st, and the efforts that were underway for that will be merged into this project. So now we're investing one time for two different purposes. In addition to increasing the data quality um, through the health information, uh, through the collaborative services project, we are also looking at how we can increase the availability of different types of data. So when we talk to organizations like the Accountable Care Organization about their efforts, as they think about things like matching, matching a person for different disparate data sets, they want to do that, they want to pay for that one time. Remember that making that investment once. So as we think about moving to phase two, which is really creating that data repository, and we think about um, the value case for this, um, we do see ourselves, the HIE does see advancing into collecting additional types of data. For example, um, being able to collect the substance use and mental health data as long as the part two solution is, is available, 
in that in that data repository. Um, potentially also bringing in the claims data because the ACO is already getting the claims data and they want to be able to match the clinical data that they're getting and the claims data using that master person index. So again, investing one time um, for multiple different purposes. Um, and the last, the last uh, type of data that we perceive may go in in place is uh, looking at some of the AHS social determinants of health data to help advance the risk stratification as an example for the ACO. So now you're seeing the creation of those foundational services and you're seeing it being used as a data repository across multiple different types of data sets. <coughs> we are on target as, the, as uh, vital will report for getting phase one done in April of 2020. Um, phase two, which is really that foundational services, the NPI terminology and interface services, by the end of um, that, that will be in place by, the, by April. And then the data repository, we believe, which is phase two, will be in place by the end of 2020 um, with the addition of those uh, additional data sets throughout 2021. Any questions on that? Yeah, can you give me an example of the terminology services? Yeah. So I'm going to give you an example of what terminology services does. So uh, it brings in potentially not, uh, data that was not necessarily standardized in the past. Um, so uh, Andrew, if you want to, uh, if you want to use diabetic yeah. as an example, they may have 30 different codes that it would identify a diabetic A1C. And terminology services is a is an opportunity to normalize it and call it one thing. So you could have 20 different codes. And it would still take it and convert it to any one C. Okay. You know, I just think I always use the word translation instead of terminology services because that's really what it's doing. It's saying like, here I'm gonna, you know, the word tomato in 30 different languages. I need it to be tomato on the back end. So if it comes in in 30 different languages, I need it to come in. I need the output to be in English. So it's translating a bunch of different ways to say the same thing. You say tomato, I say <laughs> Exactly. In the past, a lot of that information would have been left on the cutting room floor. Yeah. So it would, and so as you look at those foundational services, and we're looking at data quality and data access, in the past, if it did, if it didn't say tomato, it was just cut. Um, and and so uh, this will allow more types of data to come through. And I think Member Holmes had a quick question as well. Oh. I whispered to him. So, <laughs> I was curious about what kind of savings, cost savings, is going to happen by sunsetting, you know, the clinical registry or doing these shared uh, repository and sunsetting other things. I think yeah. estimate of what's going to be saved. We're still working on what those estimates are. What we do know is we're needing to make some additional investments at Vital, but um, the current the contract that we had. Um, for the Vermont Clinical Registry, some elements of that for data quality will move over to Vital. Okay. But overall, we're seeing an over, uh, reduction in, in the cost. I can't quantify okay. that for you. Um, what I what I can say is that as we looked at the HI at the HIT fund budget this year and going into next year, um, in the past we have typically expended about seven million dollars uh, in the last couple of years out of the HIT fund budget. The revenue into that has been about four million, um, and so with this project, um, as we look at the budget for for this for this coming calendar year and the following calendar year. We have right-sized um, the agreements that we have to what is available in the HIT, HIT fund and through the IAPD, and so there have been actual there have been savings. And that's all paying for some, you know, there's an investment made over the next couple of years to get these up and running. So, yeah, but on net savings. But there is a net savings. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Um, so my recollection is that the clinical registry was the way that the blueprint provided information to the practices. And it, what's going to happen between the time that that sunsets and the time that uh, that phase two is up and running? Yeah. So we did. We took. We worked with the blueprint to do an evaluation. And really, at this point in time, they get two um, data feeds out of uh, on an, on an annual basis out of the, of the clinical registry. Um, one of those data feeds comes at the end of the, end of the year, um, and we will be able to, uh, when the, we will be able to give, get them their, um, 
their data feed this year and at the end of next year, invite a believes that they may be able to also provide a data feed um, in, the, in the middle of the year. Either way, the middle of the year um, data, the middle of the year data feed was not necessarily for major and core operations. The practice data was really what was happening at the end of the year. So, in other words, there should not be a gap in the, in the data. Great, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I guess we're going to move on to your impossible task. <laughs> and learn how you're going to reach out to every department. <laughs> I do have questions on the actual plan, but I've been holding that until the end. Okay. Is, or do you want me to do that now? Wait. Chair, the big fire away. <laughs> the big plan. Um, I do think some of them are related to topics that you uh, already talked about. Um, so. I wanted to talk first about the financial model that's referenced in uh, the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this, I would say, is more in the form of feedback than in the form of a question. But when I was looking through the key questions and the lens that you were looking at in terms of developing the financial model, I, I thought all the questions were great, but I felt like there were some missing. And that is uh, in that the questions are really focused solely on the state investment and not looking at the total picture. So uh, in the HIT evaluation, there was a discussion of the financing model in terms of particularly those end user services and connecting them to <coughs> the customers in order for the customer voice to be heard, which makes sense. But in looking at the actual financing of it, I think you then also need to, uh, to look at uh, the impact of those dollars in the private side of the system as well. Because even if the state is not paying for it with a matched state and federal dollar, somebody is paying for it probably in a, a private insurance premium dollar. Uh, and so I think we need to be looking at the total picture, uh, not just the state side. So that would be my feedback on the financial model. Um, and I think you already answered this this question, which was when I was reading um, the strategic plan and looking at the summary of the tactical plan, I was I started to compare it to the technical roadmap, noticing then that the chart that you have on page 21 in the strategic plan is looks to me to be a condensed version of the larger chart that's in the in the technical roadmap, sorry. Uh, and it sounds like that you may have done kind of an initial first pass and pulled out some of those pieces, but that the full review of that will happen next year. Do I have that right? That is correct. Okay, and what, can you just talk a little bit about what you pulled out and why you pulled out particular items from that larger list? Mm -hmm. So as, we, um, as the year progressed, the HIE steering committee um, got strategic updates from the group that were providing the consultation on the roadmap. As they got those strategic updates, they began to incorporate that into the HIE plan. And so you will see those things that we ha already had some insight to that already incorporated in there. In addition to that, um, we, in our first pass of the, uh, the roadmap, we went through and identified things that already began to match up to those five core efforts that we were making this year, and those elements were brought for were brought forward into the plan. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, and then I've had a couple other questions that are related more to the technical roadmap. Um, so maybe I will just let you know what those are, so that you can feed that into your process as you review it. I don't. You know, it doesn't make sense necessarily for you to speak to those now, given that the steering committee hasn't looked at it. But I was particularly interested in the automating of the quality reporting um, in terms of uh, that effort. Uh, I also noticed in the, the non-technical plan in the technical roadmap <laughs> that there is a lot of discussion around quality and aligning quality measures. Uh, there's there. I wanted to just make sure that you knew there was a report that the Green Mountain Care Board did not that long ago that made some recommendations of, around further aligning quality measures. 
Um, and one of the areas, this comes up a lot, alignment of quality measures for us from the provider community, as I'm sure it does for all of you. Uh, and one of the areas that's not well understood, I don't think, is what the state has control over versus what's driven at the federal level. Mm -hmm. So I think any sort of education or um, information or clarity that you can bring around that question would be helpful because I think um, understanding what we can leverage and what we can't control is important in terms of that alignment. Um, and then there's also, of course, the whole aspect of potentially self-insured employers being able to do their own thing. Um, and then on the provider directory piece, uh, I was curious to know whether you'd be looking at any of um, any connection with like the licensing data, for example, since that I would assume that there's already a wealth of information with the licensing agencies around providers and whether it makes sense that that's totally separate or, or whatever. So I'll just pose that for you to think about. Um, and that, that was it on for what I had on the strategic plan. Thank you, Kevin. I just have a question on the DIVA contract with Vital for 20, what uh, Vital's represented in their budget is an increase from like 2.2 million to 4.1 million. And I just wanted to know, is that some services, as you talked about, that maybe you're moving from DIVA to Vital at this point? Yes, that, that's a, that is exactly right. Since the original submission of their budget, um, the collaborative services project particularly has has uh, been clarified both in phase one and in phase two. And elements such as the repository have been moved over to, to the vital contract versus an outside contract with um, another vendor. Oh, great, thanks. First, I want to say uh, congratulations. Um, this is uh, my first introduction to this with Health Tech Solutions, I think that was the name of the consulting firm. And uh, it seems that both the H H I E, the whole HAEI plan, and Vital were struggling to uh, find their focus. And as you go through this presentation today, it's clear to me that um, you've all made great progress and uh, um, that there is a momentum that has built and an, an end game um, that people can work toward kind of constructively. Um, I am curious as to um, how you're approaching the transition of the vital leadership. Um, uh, you have a new person coming on board. Uh, clearly your governance structure is working. It has some momentum um, uh, behind it. And uh, um, I'm just curious as, as how, um, uh, what you advise uh, the new vital leader to be thinking about and uh, how you might um, uh, best to integrate, integrate that person um, into this momentum? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, the vital leader has just been uh, identified and announced. Um, so we will begin working with that individual as soon as she comes on on December 2nd to orient her um, to the strategic plan, the governance process, and the upcoming contract year. Um, hoping to create some alignment on what our, our vision and, and mission has, has been um, and continues to be with a real focus on tactical implementation. If you don't mind me saying so. So when I started a couple of years ago and met the, the team, they kind of moved in mass. Like they worked all together, all of them, all of the time, right? So since that time, leadership has changed significantly across the organization and now it's much more sensical. Uh, there are individual leaders for individual work streams, and we've been able to at Diva pair teams of people with their correct teams of people and work on different subjects and progress them individually. And that's just an enormous improvement and allows us to be a lot more efficient than we, we were in the past. I also think that I'm optimistic that um, under uh, Mike Smith's leadership, that they have uh, set up a strong infrastructure within the context of vital learning of the teams that Emily just mentioned, um, and that for the foreseeable future, those teams are well established and set up to carry forward the work that's already outlined here. Um, and I'm sure that as the new CEO comes in, um, that she will become oriented to, the, to her team. And uh, I asked our Sarah uh, today two questions. Um, number one, does the um, steering committee have minutes, and I'm told you do. And the second question was, um, 
uh, has, has, there ever, has there ever been a, 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 um, a, a conflict within the steering committee where there was votes taken and there were two sides of an issue and one prevailed and one didn't, or is it pretty much a collaborative uh, exercise where um, um, you know things are intensely discussed, but it's it's there's there's not a lot of uh, of, of turf battles going on. That's such an interesting question. So, so the steering committee has evolved a lot as the HIE plan has, right? So when they first formed, their real goal was, again, to demystify this situation from each of their perspectives, how to like really illuminate what the issues and challenges were so we can move forward. And so from that standpoint, the group was really cohesive and you know able to talk about their shared challenges. Now we are entering a realm where Individual organizations have individual positions, and we're going to be asking them to weigh in more on, um, you know, how we invest in connections between electronic health records and the HIE, how we achieve this unified shared platform under the Collaborative Services Project. So we likely will see more of that in the future. We haven't had, honestly, to use voting very much, um, but in the future, it seems like that that could come up. So I've seen some maturity even in the last couple of months of the group as the HIE technical roadmap elements were, um, were presented to the group. Um, we have seen some differences of opinion. That's one of the reasons why we want to comb through the roadmap very carefully. For example, um, the vendor who uh, produced the technical roadmap put in end users, several elements of end user services, including analytics, um, including things like the care management tool, and as uh, Member Lunge uh, mentioned, also uh, things um, like the like coming up with the quality index. And there has been disagreement among the members um, uh, where they have had significant conversation but come to consensus. As we begin doing things next year, like identifying which organizations um, we want or types of organizations, not the organization themselves, that we want to connect with, I do think that there will be differences of opinion where we may need to move from consensus to voting. Just a quick follow-up question actually about the steering committee. Um, I noticed you have a vacancy and you're looking for a technologist, which makes all the sense in the world. But as I was looking through the folks that are on the steering committee, it just struck me that you don't seem that at least, maybe I'm not sure, but maybe you can tell me this, it doesn't seem like you have a super user, somebody who is that end user who's using it all the time. Um, and I'm just curious about whether or not that's that was an intentional, or you're thinking about maybe adding somebody that would be a super user, or just what the thought process there was. There's been a significant conversation in the group about uh, whether we can find um, a clinical leader to join the group. Um, we and I, I do think that that may emerge in 2020. Um, the groups that represent some of those end users like by state primary care and the Vermont Hospital Association feel like where we have had times where we've needed that input, they've gone out to their members to gather it. But I but um, I do think that potentially you may see a merge next year. Uh, a Thanks. So you know one just shift kind of from the 2017 group and how they proposed the plan to how this year's group was thinking about it. The 2017 group thought we want to keep this small and we only want to engage groups that already exist because we know that the provider community is already using their, volunteering their time on different groups and so we'll go to the primary care advisory group, for example, um, to get uh, feedback. But I think this year's group, as they really delved into more details, realized that we need more subcommittees, we need people who can be more sort of dedicated bodies on certain topics. Thank you. So, so from here, we're merging kind of the strategic plan and uh, the strategic HIV plan and the consent report to report out the progress that we've made on the HIV. Um, and there's been a significant team that I want to give credit um, that's worked on, on this, and, um, including folks at DIVA, folks at VITAL, um, and many of the, the stakeholder organizations have put a lot of time and effort. I'm going to turn it over to Maureen and Andrea, who've really been leading on the stakeholder engagement and the technical Hi there. Um, so I think I just want to start by reminding us all about the project that we've undertaken here. Um, 
Act 53 moves the Vermont Health Information Exchange from an opt-in consent policy where patients had to actively express consent that they would like to have their health histories viewed by their providers through the Vermont Health Information Exchange to an opt-out policy where um, it will be the norm that folks providers will be able to see their, their health records in the Vermont Health Information Exchange unless they uh, take the step of opting out. And the intention of this was to align the policies better with the preference of most Vermonters. We know that when asked, 95% of people say that yes, they would like to opt in and have their health information viewable. We also know that that's true, not just here in Vermont, but it's typical across the country um, for that preference to be sort of at, out of that ratio. We also know that in order for the Vermont Health Information Exchange to really be useful at the point of care, particularly when it's used through vital access, that providers need to be able to expect to go in and find a record. Um, if you're going in and routinely not finding your patients in there, you're just gonna get out of that habit pretty quickly. Um, so when we have most people in, this tool will become much more useful to providers and therefore useful to the patients that they serve. Um, as we make this shift, we've all agreed that meaningful consent is the goal and that we really want people to have an opportunity to understand how their health information is being shared and being viewed and used and have an opportunity to opt out should they wish. We really want to make that possible for people. And in order to get there, we've established three main work streams here. So one is stakeholder engagement. The second is mechanisms to support opt-out, and that's where VITAL has been um, really instrumental. And then in the evaluation methodology. I say, say that for VITAL has been really instrumental, but actually we've been teaming across all of these, just that sort of area of expertise. I want to remind you folks about our timeline here. Opt-out consent goes into effect March 1st of 2020. You're going to be hearing about this from us one more time um, before March 1st. So January 15th of 2020 will be updates to the Green Mountain Care Board and Legislative Committees. Um, the annual, this will also be incorporated into the annual reporting for the Health Information Exchange. For the Health Information Exchange Plan. So the implementation of this project, um, when you take a look at your, your slides, you'll see that there's some things here that are great. These are things that we've told you about before. Um, so I'll move quickly through those and some things that are, are in black and those are things that we're sharing with you here for the first time. Um, so we have been doing through stakeholder engagement this ongoing work of connecting with uh, advocates for all Vermonters and advocates for special populations and people with lived experience What's new here in the stakeholder engagement work is a partnership with a marketing agency to develop digital and print communications. Um, and then we're also gonna continue that work with stakeholder engagement all the way through till March. For the mechanisms, um, VITAL has been developing mechanisms for managing consent, really made some breakthroughs there. They're on track to have those mechanisms in place on February 1st. Um, they already have a consent hotline where you can call and ask questions. And that's been live since Andrew told me this as we were walking in, and I can't remember, 2014? 2015. Mm -hmm. So um, the organization already has um, plenty of experience answering consumer questions. That hotline um, right now cannot actually accept consent decisions. That's something that's coming um, down the road. But right now, it certainly is available to answer questions. Yeah, prior to March, March 1st, absolutely. Um, and we've defined, VITAL has defined new mechanisms for opting out, and those include a will include phone, an online form, and by mail. We've expanded the network of providers who can register a consent decision, for instance, including the Vermont um, uh, Chronic Care Initiative. I'm just trying to remember what VCCI stood for. Um, but they are already working with the new to Medicaid population to counsel them about their right to, to opt out and to register those decisions. Well, and do you want to take questions as you go or wait till the end? Yeah, let's do it as we go. So a couple of already popped up. Please. Um, <coughs> when you say phone, is it going to be as simple as a text? It, there's not plans for text right now. That's a great question, though. But it is a great question. So the, the challenge with that is verifying identity. And... How do you verify identity on a call? Another great question. <laughs> I was going to say that for later in the presentation, but I'll take it now. 
the there are two there are two components. So, so we certainly have access to VHAG data, and on about mm, over ninety percent of our lodgers have some sort of type of data in the VHAG. What we have established is that we that it is appropriate for vital to use VHAG data with a, an established set of criteria to verify a person's identity over the phone. Does that make sense? Yeah, it still might be a little difficult, but. The other piece of this is that there's very, um, and we actually very much appreciate the stakeholder feedback about this, is we're making this available, but only for patients that choose to opt out. Because it is the consensus of the stakeholders and everybody in our group that there is less harm that can come to a patient if someone pretends to be someone they're not by opting a patient out of the VHI. So we have made that available via phone and it's not available for someone who has previously chosen to opt out but would like to opt back in. That'll be a different mechanism. You know, this all goes back to the previous conversations we've had here the last time that we've been in, and that is that uh, I really think the legislature gave them an impossible task because it's in each of the and uh, I heard you mention that a marketing firm has been hired for materials, but I don't think you have a budget to get those materials out to people. So it, it just brings up those questions about how you're going to meet that impossible task, because it seems like they asked you to do the, the uh, limbo and they set the, the bar about an inch off the ground. I don't know how you do it. So one of the things that is new since the, since the last time that we were here is the legislature did not appropriate funding, but we were able to carve out a portion of the funding um, that was approved in the October um, high-tech um, advanced planning document from CMS. And so we will be using a portion of those funds to fund some of this work, which means that there are additional mechanisms that are available for getting information out to the, to the public. Now, it's not a lot of dollars, but it's enough to make uh, some to make some specific and targeted efforts at a broader public messaging campaign, in addition to leveraging the advocates. So do you think at the end of the talk, day that you could look in the mirror and say that you reached out to each Vermonter? At the end of the day, I believe that we'll be able to look in the mirror and say that we've done, that we've made specific efforts to target Vermonters through a wide variety of, um, or not a wide, but a variety of uh, public messaging um, avenues um, that we will have been able to reach out to populations who specifically have additional concerns um, about having their information shared and can do that um, through some of the advocacy organizations. So um, believing that we can get to a significant portion of Vermonters. Beyond that, we will focus our efforts on those individuals who have data in the health information exchange. Are the marketing materials that are being developed by this agency that you've uh, hired, are they being sent out to every advocacy firm that you partnered with on this effort? Or? Yes, absolutely. So I would have actually said about 10 years ago that we could not have achieved this um, reach with the sort of budget that we have today. And that was prior to the advent of social media or folks being really on it sort of all the time. Um, the fact that we have uh, partnerships with a number of advocacy organizations who have strong social presences and um, are also partnering with hospitals and um, hoping to partner with insurers. We're still working on building some of those partnerships out, but we do know that through social we can get some reach for uh, less money than we might have been able to in the past when we would have needed a, a large TV or radio budget for this sort of a work report. Um, but to answer your question specifically about getting this these out to advocacy organizations. Yes, absolutely, we're developing a toolkit where um, we'll have a set of things like um, social posts, um, blog or newsletter content, uh, brochures, just a variety of materials that they can use with their members to, to spread this message. What about the Vermonter without a computer? So the Vermonter without a computer, I think we are hoping for a couple of things there. One is we're hoping for a relationship with an advocacy organization um, who might be able to counsel them about this one-on-one. -on -one. In the absence of that, we are hoping that the news media will help us with this. 
Um, we are looking at ways to, to get this message out through sort of some of our broad statewide news media um, by partnering with our um, colleagues at the Vermont Department of Health. They have a strong um, PR person there who can help us with that. And also through um, the little town papers, which we know that people actually pick up and open and read um, when they come once a week. We're hoping to use those as well. What percentage of Vermonters have cell phones? Because I'm thinking people may not have computers, but in terms of cell phone and social media, do we have a sense of? I don't, I don't know that, but I definitely know that it does help with um, penetration of access to the internet. So let's see. Um, the last thing we had on the mechanisms was that Vital is actively testing the technical environment for opt out. We'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. And the third work stream here being our evaluation work, and that we have a plan for evaluation um, that's happening right now with a committee that's been assembled and it's going to convene for orientation in December. Just a little bit of a preview of uh, the rest of this presentation. So our stakeholder advocates, or work with the stakeholders um, and advocacy organizations, this began back in July. We previewed some of this with you last time we were here. We were really engaging with a whole range of types of organizations to understand the concerns and communications needs of the people they serve, really have them think together with us about communication strategies, ask for help connecting directly with the people they serve um, so that we can do like focus groups with people with lived experience and so forth and then ask these advocates to be messengers to participate in that um, rollout of the communications materials using the toolkit like we talked about a minute ago. So the advocacy organizations we engaged with here included advocates for all Vermonters, so the healthcare advocate and the ACLU. And Andrea mentioned this earlier, they were really a tremendous help in um, advancing our thinking about the threshold of, of identity verification necessary for opting out of the health information exchange and really thinking about this new lower threshold that's different than the threshold for, for opting back in, for instance. So I think that was really great progress that we made uh, with our partners there. Then we also worked with advocates for special populations. So that included um, populations with additional privacy concerns due to stigmatized conditions, for instance, um, HIV, AIDS, mental health disorders, substance use disorders. Um, populations with additional privacy concerns due to safety, for instance, people with uh, experience of domestic violence. And then populations who may require different communications approaches. So people for whom English is not a first language, um, and also um, the community of people with developmental disabilities. <coughs> So we went and we did uh, focus groups with a number of people with lived experience. Uh, we were invited by the advocacy organizations. This came out a little differently on the screen than I expected. Um, mostly it's the same, but we've got some funny characters over there on the left. But this, what you're seeing right here is sort of a still of uh, animation we used to describe the Vermont Health Information Exchange in these focus groups and essentially telling people about how the information they share with the provider flows into the Vermont Health Information Exchange and then can flow back to other providers, whether they present in an emergency department with too much pain to be able to remember their medication history or go to a new doctor in another town for the first time. Um, we were also able to, I think those characters, what they're meant to say is, what happens if you opt out? And <laughs> What we were showing there is that um, when you opt out, the information is still in the Vermont Health Information Exchange. It's just not viewable to your providers. So there's some nuances we were playing with how to communicate. And what we really learned in this process is, um, is something that is encouraging, which is that this is explainable. I think when I took this project on initially, I thought, oh my goodness, how are we ever going to explain this really complicated technical thing to, um, to patients? And, I'm confident now that we can. I think our challenge looking ahead is to do it not in sort of the five, 10 minutes that I had at the beginning of each focus group with undivided attention, but in you know 30 seconds as people are scrolling through their, their social feed. So um, it's not that we don't have a challenge ahead of this, but I am optimistic that it, it's something that we can meet. So we had uh, seven focus groups, included um, some of the special populations I referenced earlier and people um, who are patients of medical centers or sort of just general population. Um, and 
in that, we, we really learned quite a bit and more than we were able to share with you last time we were here, where we were sort of part way through this work. You know, last time I was here, I talked to you about how clear it was becoming that people just didn't know what the Vermont Health Information Exchange was. And I want to build on that now and say I think that there's little current knowledge about health information sharing rules and practices generally. People are operating in a fairly low information environment and operating with a lot of trust of their providers, that their providers are keeping their information private. Um, I do think that this is important for our work, an important piece of uh, information for our work, because we've found that when we explain what happens if you opt out of the health information exchange and explain how your doctors will share information sort of um, in the usual way, folks become, um, the, the few folks who are trepidatious about the health information exchange become much more comfortable with it. It just becomes, oh, that's, that's the modern way of transmitting this information. Once they understand that their providers are allowed to share information about their physical health already with other treated providers without any additional signatures, um, the whole thing becomes a little bit more comfortable for them. So our challenge is going to be not just communicating what the Vermont Health Information Exchange is, but sort of how it fits into how information is allowed to be shared anyways. Um, the next thing I'll say that we learned here is going to sound really basic and obvious, but I think it's worth repeating, and that's that health information is personal and that privacy matters. Um, there's different levels at which it matters to people, and it's pretty clear that some of that depends on uh, who you are. So there was one room that I was in, and this was the only one where this came up, where somebody said, you know, I'm, I'm an open book. I, I don't mind if people can see my information. That would be just fine. That was very rare. That was one person of all the folks we met with, and that I ultimately came to understand is, is really a privilege if you can sit in a place where that is true for you. And for a number of folks, particularly people who have conditions that have been stigmatized or communities that have been historically marginalized, there's a lot more concern about what might happen to them should their information get out more broadly, and even concern about what um, <coughs> their, you know, a new provider might might think of them or um, might assume based on sort of past records. So just something that we, we need to be aware of moving forward is how this impacts different people and different populations differently. Something that everybody was really able to agree on and kind of in, in sort of the same way, there wasn't a lot of variation across folks here, is that more information <coughs> is equals better care. Um, there was a little bit of an asterisk on that, which is folks were saying, um, it's, it's better care if my doctor sees it and uses it. And folks are aware, I think, that their doctors have tremendous amounts of information coming at them, um, and that care works best, and that, that um, physician-patient pa partnership works best when the provider is actually able to access and spend some time with their information. There's a sense of hopefulness around health information exchange that, that we picked up in these meetings, especially with folks with really complicated health histories or who had family members with really complicated health histories. And that hopefulness is around um, reducing the administrative burden of health care for them and really allowing them to get to the, the heart of the matter with their doctor and not be spending their time remembering you know, the date of the second of seven surgeries that their child has had, but really being able to move past those details and really dig in on what matters with their providers. And, and folks are feeling hopeful that Health Information Exchange can help achieve that. And the last thing here is uh, just what I mentioned earlier, that this is something that is explainable when we have some time and attention. Any questions about what we were learning from Vermonters in these groups before we move on? Okay, so um, our communication strategy here, three-pronged, um, we're going to be working through providers. This is who patients say they want to hear this information from. It's also just the logical place. It's where the data is, is created and used. Um, through advocates, this is reaching special populations through existing strong and trusting relationships. And then directly from the state of Vermont and vital. And this is reaching Vermonters, not reached in other channels and reinforcing the message because we do know from communications theory that it's going to take multiple touches in order for people to um, in, you know, digest this message. Direct from the state of Vermont and Vital, I'll say 
would, that thinking includes um, news media there. Our communications partnership includes an advertising agency who is going to be developing digital and print communications, including a small website, a video, brochures that will be available in um, most medical centers and providers' offices, and social media content. We've partnered with other departments beyond DIVA at the state to leverage both their digital properties and some of their, their production resources, for instance, their public relations staff. And then another communications partnership is, per the legislation, um, the legislation was encouraging us to work with the healthcare advocate to make sure that people could get questions answered through the healthcare advocate. Um, and we're partnering with them to train up their staff to make sure that they're ready to support decision making. So our timeline for this, we are working fast and furiously right now. Um, we're creating opportunities for feedback on the messaging with our um, advertising agency in the first week of December from advocates and hoping to engage some folks with lived experience there as well. We're launching a simple website December 16th with more content added um, through January. We'll be training advocacy organizations on um, sort of all the nitty gritty details of the Vermont Health Information Exchange so that they can help support sort of one on one conversations with their members and answer questions there. We'll be distributing messaging tools to advocacy groups beginning in December with updates distributed through February and toolkit training in January. And our very first messages from the state of Vermont and Vital will go out in December, but we do know um, that we wanna intensify those in January and February, both as we're getting closer to go live, but also recognizing that um, you know, traditionally, you just treat December as a lost month for communications efforts, unless it's a, you know, post-Christmas sales. So. When you were identifying the uh, advocacy groups to uh, reach out to, um, how did you measure your success, and what was the uh, response rate? Sure. So. Um, The response rate was good. Well, almost everybody we reached out to wanted to participate in conversations about this. We've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks across, oh, you know, I, I want to say, you know, every special population you can think of, but of course I'll get in trouble by saying that because certainly we've, we've missed somebody, but we've um, made a real effort, and there's been a bit of a snowball sample, so anytime we're with an advocacy organization, we're saying, is there anybody else you think that we should be talking to about this subject? typically folks have, have offered up some ideas and we've um, tracked those down and the folks there have said yes. It would also be fair to say that one of the other um, demonstrations of success is that they have, those advocacy organizations have helped to coordinate and invite um, folks in to talk with individuals who have lived experience um, that they're serving. And so that I think is kind of also another demonstration of success. from providers about their role? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have had some really interesting conversations with organizations representing providers. And one of the things that I think everybody was hoping would come out of this process was a reduction in provider burden. And previously, providers were the only ones who were managing consent um, decisions. And Vital has now taken on that role, so that's a huge step forward. <coughs> Looking looking out to March 1st, organizations that have historically collected consent electronically and really built that into their workflows and have that um, operating smoothly are likely to just sort of flip the script and move to opt-out consent, just continue doing things that way. For organizations that have been doing this on paper or have been doing it sort of um, less um, routinely, they may make the choice to just go ahead and have a brief conversation with the folks that they see at registration, hand them a brochure, and say, um, please direct your questions to VITAL, and VITAL, it, this hotline is where you can go to register your consent decision. We think that's gonna be a lot easier for providers, and we've been um, supported by, um, by state, the Vermont Medical Society, the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, 
Um, they've been partnering with us both to really think through this and what it's going to mean for providers, and then also to help develop communications that go direct to providers about this topic. So Maureen, one of the things that I want to mention in that it was a game changer is when the providers, uh, as Maureen said, didn't feel like they had to collect and transmit the data, the, the, the data and information. Um, what, there was kind of a panic moment when they said, well, we still have a role in it. We said, yes, we will always have a role. But the biggest barrier they were experiencing was the actual transmission of that data. So when we said that we could collect that information by phone um, and that they could support someone in making that call, it, it did change the conversation. Thank you. And then the other question I had was, um, in terms of the other departments that you worked with on leveraging their social media, et cetera, obviously the Department of Health you've already mentioned. I was curious which other departments you've worked with. So I probably should have been more nuanced in saying that. Um, I should have also said other divisions of, of DIVA. So we have our, our Hey You Health Access Eligibility yep. and Enrollment Unit, and they have a social presence and um, experience reaching out to Vermonters for enrollment. Um, and so, so they are the main other one I'm thinking of in addition to DEH, although we have been encouraged to think about um, other social channels like ag and so forth, but are playing with whether it's appropriate to go too far beyond sort of health and human services with this sort of thing. Thank you. So uh, the last thing here is really how, how to opt out. What are the options here? Um, and we've gone through much of this already, but really just to remind folks that our focus here is on easy opt-out options for Vermonters. Um, and, and reducing burden for providers, and that the options will be at providers' offices, meaning um, at most providers' offices, um, you well, at some providers' offices, you will get to register this decision. At other providers' offices, you will get presented with the option through um, a brief conversation and a brochure, and then you can make a phone call, or you can go online, or you can do this by mail, really trying to reach people who have a wide range, whether they don't have a computer, or whether um, they would, you know, just prefer to do things by phone. So, Oscar, Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, sure. So, I think I think the overall message is we're trying to make it easier, protect patient privacy, and reduce the burden on providers. So, it's we think we're on the right track, and based on our conversations with other stakeholders and advocacy groups, they are also in alignment with that. Um, I will also add that in addition to calling the vital consent hotline, which will be the same number that it is now, they can also con contact the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. And I think that is part of Act 53 as well. So I just wanted to mention that. And one detail that I haven't pointed out yet that I think I probably should is that all consent decisions that were made before March 1st will be carried forward. And that vital has been working and doing work to test to ensure that that those previous consent decisions are carried forward. Um, so I think that that's a nuance that I want to make sure folks caught. Vital has built a lot of the technology behind the scenes and is beginning to test that technology already. Um, and so that's the other aspect of this, not just not just doing the outreach, but also making sure that the consent decisions are reported. So the last thing here is testing um, how we did. Did we reach everybody? And um, Mary Kate Molman, uh, back at Diva, is helping develop an evaluation team. And that evaluation team is going to be addressing four key questions. Um, that's have we reached people? Is the message clear, not just to us, but is it clear enough that it is understood by the people who receive it? Um, and are the opt-out options easy? We'll also be keeping an eye on which providers are offering opt-out. But um, as we shift to this, environment where VITAL is really the primary organization managing consent that, that will become less and less critical to the project. Um, the evaluation committee has been assembled. Uh, we'll be meeting in December for orientation, and there will be an evaluation plan draft completed and included in our next uh, submission, uh, report submission to the Green Mountain Care Board and the legislature. I can anticipate one of the questions will be uh, when will the, the, some of the initial evaluation data be available? Because um, I know up on the slide it says that we've added information to the patient experience survey. Um, we anticipate that that, that, those, that that is currently in the field and that those results will be available in 2020. 
Um, in addition, VITAL is continuing to collect some of the metrics that they have been in terms of the number of decisions that have been registered and some of the other, other available data. Um, and as necessary, we can present that. Member Holmes, did you have a question? You were looking at. <laughs> Actually, I have a question, but I was looking at somebody else was coming up first, so I will leave it up to I have uh, just a follow up on the technical components. Um, in the uh, November 1st report, there was a little outline of the different activities that you're engaging in. Uh, and I was just curious to ask if everything was on track. Um, and whether what you're either most worried about and most optimistic about into, on the technical side. Those are great questions. Um, first of all, to answer the, the first question, yes, we are on track. We are on track. We are currently testing the configuration update, and that's going well. We are on track to be capable on February first, which is what we're supposed to do. Um, I think what we're most worried about is protecting patient privacy. That, that really is something that we take very seriously. And we feel like we have vetted all of these options um, that sometimes may be a little too long <laughs> and have complex conversations, but they're all really important. So we're worried about that. We're also worried about, about being able to audit. And um, so far, we have the capability to track everything that we do, and we feel really confident about that. I think what we're most optimistic about, or at least me, I can't speak for the entire team, but I'm optimistic about who we've been able to work with, with Maureen and Jenny and Emily when she was not on leave, and, um, and many others in the group have made significant contributions as well as the engagement of the stakeholders. Okay, Jess. Uh, uh, so I did anticipate, I, you did anticipate the question about it, when that would be available. My other question would be, you have the consent hotline on up now. So I'm wondering about the traffic on that hotline, what types of questions, concerns you're hearing. It's interesting. We actually don't get a lot of traffic, depending on how you, how you measure that. We probably get a couple of consent calls a month. And they're mostly about, um, can Vital send my record to X organization? Those kinds of questions. So there is certainly some education that needs to happen in terms of what a vital role in, in the ecosystem is. And we, you know, fortunately, are, are on the right track with that. But there's a lot of work to do. And my final just comment is I just want to thank you for the thoughtfulness and thoroughness with which you're trying to implement the opt-out plan for the state. And I think, you know, what you've laid out is impressive. So I appreciate it. Any other questions from the board? If not, we'll open it up to public comments or questions. Eric. I just want to thank the team for the thoughtfulness and engagement uh, with the stakeholders. I think taking um, meaningful consent as a kind of guiding star and not focusing just on provider burden, but making sure Vermonters have a meaningful opportunity to understand what they're consenting to. I think that's really laudable. Um, you know, also the lived experience of Vermonters, I think, is a, a critical um, way to think about informing decisions, and it's a data source that we don't often use enough. Um, and, you know, the evaluation process has also um, been interesting, and I think uh, Mary Kate is an exceedingly competent and thoughtful person, and I look forward to uh, working with her on the evaluation as part of that team. And um, it's, it's, it is, you're correct, uh, Member Holmes, it's an exceedingly thoughtful and deep process. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Other members of the public? Yes. Kirsten Murphy from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. I, too, would just want to um, express my thanks that the concerns of our community have been heard and we continue to partner um, well with the team and um, appreciate the process that they put in place. Thank you. Other public comment questions? Seeing none, I wish to thank you for a great presentation.
Thank you. Thank Try you. to stay warm. Thank you. You too. So at this point, I'll invite the uh, folks in vital to come on down. Presenters have mentioned 
is the addition of the second phase to the collaborative services project. This new phase is the acquisition and implementation of a new data repository and the incorporation of Vitals HDM in the Vermont Clinical Registry into that data um, repository. In addition, the new contract has a significant increase in work scope um, and represents an increase in the capabilities of the VCon. We at VITAL really appreciate the opportunity to work on these projects and rec rec recognize the importance of this work to uh, the state of Vermont. So we see this as a vote of confidence by the state following the hard work that we've done over the past two years. Um, it should be noted that negotiations for this contract were completed in early October. It went into a review cycle. Um, we expect to sign it at the end of um, the year. So with that, Bob, in your uh, budget order, uh, there was a requirement to come back in December um, for these type of adjustments. It sounds like you're not going to have this thing executed until the end of December. And it's my understanding from talking with Sarah that it may be more appropriate to have that in January. Is that your thinking? Um, yeah, I think that would make the most sense, Sharon Holmes. Um, and Vital is prepared to uh, support that. Uh, so yeah. Does anyone on the board have any objections to that? Okay. I just have one question on the million and a half that was being added as revenue. Have you been able to identify what expenses you're putting in as well for that? So obviously your expenses went up by about a million and a half as well, but what yeah, I, those were I, I um, will talk about that in um, a previous slide, but if you'd like, we can, we can skip forward. No, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, so, so moving on, um, this is a matrix comparing CY20, our, our new contract, with CY19, our existing contract. And the first two columns that you'll note um, compare the two existing contracts. And, and you'll note that uh, this new contract represents almost a doubling of um, the contractual value um, on a calendar year basis for, for vital. Um, well, some things have remained the same, such as um, our operations uh, line item and our data access, data quality, and connectivity um, work scope. The new contract adds new work scope for consent management to prepare us um, for the change in consent policy um, in March, along with um, work scope for connecting EMS and emergency services to the VHI, along with um, the phase one projects of the universal MPI or master patient index, along with terminology services and a new Rhapsody hosting. As I mentioned previously, the new contract also adds a second phase, the acquisition and implementation of the new data repository. The two rightmost columns here in this chart um, split the CY20 contract into VITAL's fiscal year 20 and 21. And just to clarify, the term for the new contract is January 1, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. VITAL's fiscal year, on the other hand, runs July 1st through June 30th. So VITAL's FY20 uh, fiscal year will have two six months, pardon me, of this new contract. And as you can see, most of the phase one work um, is estimated to occur in FY20, and most of the phase two work is expected to occur in FY21. Moving on to revenue, um, this chart includes our final audited numbers from FY19, which are presented along with VITAL's FY20 budget, 
uh, the one that was approved back in June by the New York Care Board. Also with it is a forecast for FY20, which reflects the addition of a new work scope from the CY20 contract. Now, our original budget for FY20 assumed that the CY20 budget would be less than the C CY19. We had always expected that there would be a continued decrease to our state funding. Secondly, that the collaborative services partners would each pick up the implementation cost of the project that they were leading. This construct has changed since our review in May. And finally, the original budget included about $400,000 of revenue associated with costs shared amongst the participants. The new FY20 forecast includes the revenue for a new work scope, including consent management connectivity um, to EMS and emer emergency services, along with the phase one work and phase two acquisition costs and the start of the implementation. Um, phase two really represents more of an unknown for us at this time because we won't have finished our vendor selection. Um, until that happens, we, will have a, we won't have a complete picture of the magnitude and the timing of, of the costs associated with phase two. Right now, it is really a um, rough order of magnitude estimate. Um, and so we hope by the first uh, quarter that we'll have a, a clearer picture on what that cost is and when, when the timing of that is. Finally, the last column on the right um, is our current financials through September year to date. Um, it shows in total that we have recognized $1.3 million or 22% of our, our current approved FY20 budget. This puts us on target with where we expected to be in September, which was um, a year-to-date budget of 1,271,000. So just a little bit over um, what we expected. We expect that our expenses will be uh, 1.5 million greater than our budget. This is driven by a number of items. First, there will be an increase in our IT expenditures, especially in the network cost area, to facilitate the, uh, the changes that we're implementing, along with uh, consulting support to augment vital staff in implementing these new projects. Um, and uh, to point out that we also have in this budget or in this forecast, we do have additional costs for education and outreach associated with the consent management. So we have money for um, brochures, posters, and also a, a modification to our website to facilitate um, educational outreach for consent. It is our strategy um, as we move along to keep our workforce lean and adding only a new position to, to address the ongoing maintenance of the new functionality. We've done that with uh, the mindset that we don't want to bring on a whole uh, slew of new employees, only to have to uh, lay them off at the uh, conclusion of the project. Uh, finally, in terms of our expense forecast, I've added a contingency of around 2%. Um, and this it addresses the um, unknowns associated with the phase two uh, project. Overall, we expect to be at year end to be at the same net income as what we had budgeted in FY20. And finally, on this page, um, as shown in the far right column, are our current expenses. While they are $330,000 low for the plan, this is driven by two things. One, lower labor costs than projected, and lower IT costs. Part of this is due to the inventorying of labor and 
uh, services connected with the collaborative services project until we actually recognize the revenue uh, due to the completion of the projects. Um, since we don't have a contract, that won't happen until the first half of FY20, pardon me, first half of C120. Before you go to the next one, can you just explain um, on the personnel related expense line uh, why your forecast is going to be five times uh, what the first quarter is? What's the new positions that are being added or, or what is the, the new? We, we are in the process of adding uh, two new individuals, um, one a network security analyst um, and the second me. M MBI and terminology uh, uh, services maintenance. In addition, um, we expect that uh, we have our strategic um, technical advisor is also in that mix um, as well. So moving on uh, to the balance sheet, um, Vitals balance sheet is strong. Um, you will notice that um, there is growth in work in process. Again, these represents, represent inventory costs um, that Vital is keeping on the books until we complete uh, certain aspects of the project and can recognize the um, revenue upon the completion of the project. Um, so, right now in FY20, um, in the third month of the year, we have about 300,000. We expect that to actually rise to about 800,000 by the end of the year. And there really will be two, um, if you will, tranches. This tranche that we have right now in inventory represents phase one work that we have inventory. We expect that that to be relieved from inventory again in the first quarter, first and second quarter of CY20. Um, the largest portion in the forecast for the end of the year really represents phase two implementation costs, which we won't be able to recognize revenue on until we've completed those projects. We expect if you look at this in totality, that our cash flow is sufficient to cover our work scope as we go forward. Um, so even though the estimate for our liabilities will increase in this period, we believe that we have the financial resources to uh, cover this. What happens in the first few months of your year that uh, you've got your 19 audited uh, receivables at 1.2 and after the three months, they're down to 651. Yeah. What is the timing there that makes for such a large discrepancy? Well, um, Mike used to uh, chide me on that the state doesn't have a, a blackout at the end of the year, where that's um, where towards the end of the year there is a slowdown in some of the um, payment of invoices. Um, when I forecast, I've always um, taken a very um, conservative approach and <coughs> kept between 45 and 60 days of, of invoices um, on the books. And in this year, the state has um, been uh, very, um, if you will, they have um, been very good in making sure that they have been after our uh, invoices that we've submitted um, and they've been very timely. So um, I probably am somewhat conservative on my forecast, but um, it also is an aspect that in at the end of FY20, I also expect that we'll have some fairly large invoices out 
It was interesting to see if the new uh, Secretary of AHS would be as high as the payments. <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> Okay, um, and this, this chart just summarizes our cash flow position. Um, as of September, we have a very strong cash flow position at 147 days. By the end of the year, we expect to be at over, over 80 days, but still, um, we feel that this is enough on hand to cover our cash requirements. Um, so, before I turn over um, the microphone to Christopher, are there any other questions on my presentation that I can answer for the board? For you? Um, sure. Uh, first, just going back to the million and a half that we had in revenue, and you obviously had a million and a half in expenses, but you didn't really align how much of the expenses are specifically related to that revenue. I mean, you're putting in the contingency, you're putting in um, consultants versus hiring people. So just trying to understand, you know, what that million and a half was generating from an expense side. Um. Because you talked about education, um, increase in IT consulting support, some of those things are not all directly related to the additional money that I have for the well, phase two. The, the pickup between our FY20 budget and our FY20 forecast primarily represents the increase that we feel was necessary to um, bring us to to be able to complete the work that is in front of us with the CY20 contract. So, for instance, um, we're adding another 800,000 for uh, consultants to support us during that, that time period. That represents solely, that represents distinctly um, work that is to be done um, on the collaborative services project. Okay. And then looking at your cash flow, um, you do see a change from budget, um, the negative 218 going to 702, so a $500,000 change. It's not as impactful because you beat your cash position um, at the end of 19. You came in at 2.5 versus your, where you would have started your budget at 2.2. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to talk about, so, how comfortable are you with where your cash position will be ending? And I know you have talked in the past about needing to subsidize, you know, needing to be able to have this cash to bank and, and then in effect if your revenue was going to be going down. And, you know, maybe that's not going to happen now in 21 because of the new phase two. But. I, I think the biggest wild card for us um, in terms of cash flow for the end of the year is really what are the timing of the payments and the magnitude of the payments um, for the vendor that we select for phase two? And we don't really have a definitive, um, we don't have a contract with any vendor or we don't even really have, I'll take this back, we have RFP um, submittals, but they're not, one of the proposals from uh, vendors. So we're a little bit at, out near the edge of our headlights on this. Um, so if, if you, for me, as a financial person, that's, that's one of the biggest things that worries me is just the timing of those costs and the magnitude. And so right now what's in there is I have about $750,000, which is an estimate, uh, in terms of what would hit our um, expense, well, what would hit our cash flow in the um, FY20, at the end of FY20. And then just one last question on your 
your working process increase, which is pretty significant, the 800,000. And you talked about the FASB change for revenue recognition. Do those go hand in hand? And I mean, have you assumed any of the revenue in your revenue forecast um, that would be generated from this web there? Um, I think there are going to be two different two different things going on. There is there is a an effect due to the um, the FASB ruling in terms of performance obligations, and um, some of those performance obligations may actually stretch out beyond the fiscal year, and may need to be recognized in the following in the subsequent fiscal year. That's that's part of the FASB um, standard as I, I understand it now. And then the other part of it is that um, we may not have completed work um, and it may roll over, that work may roll over into the next fiscal year um, uncompleted and therefore we can't recognize the expense without recognizing the revenue. So they're just kind of like two different things going on. Okay. In our last update in August, I shared with you details of our focus on security. Here are some updates since that last week. Uh, as security is our top priority at Vital, we continue making smart and secure technology choices. Just after our last update in August, we completed our off-site backup. We also upgraded our office security program with improved access controls, security cameras, and more. In September, we further secured our employee VPN, completed our scheduled third quarter security scan, and working with the Agency of Digital Services, we finalized our business domain assessment, uh, which included improving many of our policies and procedures, such as our change advisory board and our design and review board processes. Finally, last month, we began vendor contracting for a 24-7 data security monitoring service, revised our vital access auditing documentation, and began implementing a password manager for our employees. Beyond security, we are still committed to making smart technology choices. Vital is choosing modularity, allowing us to plug and play technologies and facilitate the collaborative services projects. We are choosing agility to give us scalability and disaster recoverability, which is being driven by our recently completed business impact analysis. These choices not only provide enhanced technological capabilities, but also financial benefits. They stabilize our infrastructure expenses and avoid capital expenditures while reducing financial obligations and commitments. Most importantly, as Vital makes smart technology choices, we are aligning ourselves with our collaborative services partner organizations. Before I hand it off to Carolyn, who's going to talk more about the collaborative services projects, do you have any questions about our security or technology? I do. So. Uh what is your geographic uh, 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 backup for a problem that would occur? Say there's a flood. Mm -hmm. where, where do you have data stored? So our, our primary data center is in South Burlington, and we have local backups there. But we also have an off-site backup, um, which is in the Azure East region, which I believe is in the DC area. So if we had a complete catastrophic failure of our data center, and even our local backups were completely destroyed. We have a backup um, in Microsoft's Azure Data Center. Okay. And you're, I'm sure you did the analysis. And you believe that what impacted Winooski would not impact that center as well? The South Burlington Data Center? Yeah, the South Burlington in, in uh, Washington. I'm just. Curious. You know, it's a fascinating topic. Years ago, I remember um, being part of a legislative delegation that went down and tried to convince Wall Street when the rules were changed that required um, 
back up, and I can't remember what the miles, if it was 200 miles or what, that Vermont was sufficiently just outside of the radius that they got to locate some backup here. We weren't very successful in that effort, but I was just curious how you ended up picking that site. So when, when you look at uh, you know, our strategy for where we're going to store our data, um, there's more things than just as far away from you know, our current location as possible that as uh, latency and data transfer and things like that. So um, you know, typically 200, 250 miles is, a, is a, a pretty good strategy. Now, of course, there are possible events that could affect both Washington, D.C. and Burlington, Vermont. Um, but we, we do have plans going forward to even further protect our data and have an additional archive data location that's on the other side of the country. Great. That's actually going to tie into the Collaborative Services Project. Super. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Karen. All right, thank you, Um, As you know, and you heard from Diva, we've been working in partnership with uh, Diva, the Blueprint for Health, and One Care Vermont on this collaborative services project. It's super exciting, and we're trying to streamline the way things are working. Um, so, we focused on the first phase is on the foundational infrastructure that was identified um, a few years ago as a key component that we needed to improve. Um, the universal MPI or master patient index is the first piece of that. We selected Grotto for the solution in June and in September, we completed our implementation of the root development, and then we're in testing right now. I will let you know that the early results we're seeing from testing look really promising, and this will get us towards one of the HIE plan goals of trying to get as close to one record for every patient in their person in Vermont that's in the system as we can. Um, the next two pieces, the terminology services and the interfacing, have uh, we've selected Turn Atlas and Rhapsody, hosted by the Maine Health Information Exchange or Health InfoNet, uh, and their subsidiary Curious Innovations. Um, they're currently setting up the environments right now, and we are targeting the end of the year for this to complete. This will include. Um, three environments, one for development, one for testing, and one for production, as well as disaster recovery, to your point, Kevin, um, as, as a backup plan. And those will be um, available to us all by the end of the year. Um, after that, configuration, implementation, and testing will start in early 2020. We've made great progress this year on, on phase one, and this is also setting us up for the second phase. This is, the second phase kicked off in October, and this involves selecting a shared healthcare data platform. Um, this will replace, as Jenny mentioned, both the VHI data management solution and the Vermont Clinical Registry, uh, enabling efficiencies moving forward for both of us and allowing us to shed some of the older legacy platforms um, that, that we both have. The primary goal right now is to support these two programs initially. However, as we're moving forward, we're keeping an eye on other capabilities for other types of data or services in the future, like social determinants of health or claims data that our stakeholders are really asking us to ingest in the future. Um, since this is going to be a shared platform, we've assembled a core team of stakeholders to help select the platform from multiple agencies and programs across the state. These include representatives from VITAL, uh, Department of Vermont Health Access, the Agency of Digital Services, Blueprint for Health, One Care Vermont, Vermont Care Partners, by State Primary Care Association, and um, Vermont Care Board staff. So the collaborative group has been super engaged and we've been meeting weekly, sometimes more than weekly, um, 
and is they're providing valuable insights have helped to keep the project moving along in a timely manner. Um, one of the first tasks that the project team undertook was agreeing on the scope of the project and the process we wanted to use. Um, the team chose to use an accelerated but thorough process due to the desire to have the platform ready for January 2021 for the state reporting needs. Uh, this is an aggressive timeline, so we wanted to accelerate the project right from the start. Um, what we did to start that was we used the request for information that Vital did in late 2018 to help us evaluate potential vendors for the project and also use the core team to identify any other known vendors that we might have missed in 2019. Um, Vital had done an RFI looking at feasibility of switching platforms at that time. The, the goal, is, the immediate goal is selecting the top three to five vendors for a full evaluation by this core team. These selected vendors will be brought on site for two days of intensive presentations and demos in December uh, that will cover eight specific areas that the team wants to see and evaluate. The demos will involve not only the core team, but other subject matter experts identified by the core team. We're trying to be as inclusive in this process as we can and get everyone's feedback. Um, using this format will streamline the traditional processes of gathering detailed information via written responses and then scheduling the demos by combining it all into this concentrated timeline um, so that we can accelerate this. We'll also be undertaking a separate but parallel effort to do due diligence on the companies, on these vendors during this time frame. Um, this will include financial positions of the company, vendor reference checks, and then external client checks as well as their preferred vendors, or their preferred clients. Um, the team has established uh, draft sc scoring criteria based on the eight areas that we're looking to evaluate and we'll be working to finalize this over the next few weeks. Um, after the presentations, the next steps will be to score the vendors and produce a request for proposal to include final pricing of the solutions and any additional questions that the teams have after the full process. And then to make a selection uh, in February is the target. We've made great progress so far uh, and the core team's been an invaluable asset in the process going forward. Any questions? I guess you have questions. Okay, so the quarterly report are the usual metrics that should be familiar, and they are ending the month of September. The meaningful use of security risk assessment consultations, you see a drop in the numbers. We can often see these kinds of fluctuations toward the end of the year as healthcare organizations prepare to attest for meaningful use. I think we'll see, I believe, we'll see that go back up in October. But um, it's a valuable service that is the healthcare providers rely on to improve the quality and efficiency of their electronic health The percentage uh, percent of Vermont patients providing consent, we can see this ending September is starting to plateau, which um, interestingly enough, we we had sort of a pool of, um, of people, a vital predicting there would be a plateau at about 50%. So we'll see how far we get here, but after March 1st, 2020, we expect this to be 95%. Connectivity criteria, the new replacement interfaces, this is in September. We had a target of 89 completed work plans this year. We've uh, obviously exceeded that with 121 completed work plans, tremendous effort on um, the operations team, and 22 more are in progress. There are also 11 locations meeting tier two criteria. So this is um, speaking to the connectivity criteria that's coming up in 2020. We should see more of these next year. From a point of care perspective, we continue to maintain and 
quickly. Um, in the increased utilization of the three ways to access patient information, the top green chart, bar chart, remains steady. Those are the number of vital access patient uh, acts or record or providers accessing patient records through the web portal. The bottom red column is the cross-community access piece. Those are the queries out into the integrated solution, queries across networks from organizations, healthcare, uh, electronic healthcare records. And the purple column are single sign-on chart accesses via the web portal. And those are next to as well. Another aspect of point of care utilization are the provider results delivery. These are ordering providers having laboratory results, radiology reports, and transcribed reports delivered seamlessly into their electronic health records. A lot of times the providers do not know that those are facilitated by vital. And we have seen a little bit of an uptick. Um, we predicted it would go down, and we actually may, we haven't, um, we're not sure if we'll see impacts from the UVMMC consolidation or not, but we, we may. And um, I think the message here is that over a million results have been delivered across uh, the, starting in January of 2019. It's a significant service that we provide, and uh, 443 providers received those results in the state of Vermont. This um, actually concludes our update. Are, are there any other questions we can, I can answer, we can answer? Questions from the board? I just have a quick one. Can you, can you go back to 21? Sure. Can you just give me a sense of the denominator? I don't know what everyone looks like. The connectivity criteria. What is the denominator, 11 locations? Out of how many are you thinking? It's potential. Yeah, so um, I want to say Within the state of Vermont, we have, I think it's 1,200 locations that we've identified. Out of those, we know that about 500 have electronic medical records. Um, and out of that subset, I think we're, I'll get this wrong, so I'm just gonna say above 250 yeah. locations that are connected. Um, so what we've done this year is, with the advent of the new connectivity criteria, we've gone out and those 121 completed work plans were an evaluation of these locations to say, where are you along that continuum? You clearly are connected, so you're, or you're in the process of connecting right now. So you're, you're meeting tier one. Where, you know, can you meet tier two? And we've laid out where they've met tier two and where they've fallen short of tier two and helped develop a plan with the healthcare organization to get themselves to tier two. And we've had 11 locations actually that represents two different vendors get to that place. Um, and I have more coming that just met in late October. So, uh, you know, we're working with the organizations and their vendors and the criteria is really providing a useful tool to be able to say to a vendor, this is what you need to do for all the health reform programs in the state and here's the bar you need to clear, and they have concrete marching orders. So that's helped both the clients be able to put some pressure on the vendors and, and also us, and, and we've had some good success. I won't say it's um, the golden ticket because we're still dealing with the HR vendors who can uh, prove to be a little difficult sometimes, but it's, it's definitely helping the conversation. Other questions or comments from the board? If not, we'll open it up for public comment or questions. Anyone? Seeing none, I wish to thank you for your presentation. And, uh, thank for you those for who are us. staring at the clock, the clock is wrong. It's not four <laughs> after five. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a safe travel. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.